Nice to see everybody here tonight. And welcome to South High School's Financial Aid Night for 2018. Um, I know senior year has just barely begun, but already seniors and their parents have to start making a lot of serious uh, decisions, or at least begin some serious exploration in preparation for next year. Uh, during the course of the next two weeks, uh, we counselors are going to be meeting with all seniors, uh, particularly those who are planning to go on to a four-year or a two-year uh, university or college after high school to make sure that you're getting done what needs to get done college applications, and all of that other stuff. And tonight you're going to learn more about the full financial aid process, uh, how you can qualify to get financial assistance of different kinds, and the timelines that you'll need to keep in mind in order to make sure you can take full advantage of those resources. Oh, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Regan Hollett. I'm one of the counselors uh, here at South High. So the first thing I want to show you briefly is the Our Counseling Center's website, which includes scholarship and financial aid information. Once I'm done with that, I'm going to turn it over to two presenters we have from the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation, who will take a few minutes to tell you about the local scholarships uh, that they coordinate. And then the main part of our presentation will be uh, from a <coughs> presenter that we have from Lakeland University, who will go through the entire FAFSA process on the federal application for student aid. So um, everything that you or that is going to be shown tonight, first of all, is being recorded uh, and within the next week or so we will have that posted online. And also the information that is shared is going to be available on our website as well. So I just want to quick show you how to get uh, to the Counseling Center website. This is the South High homepage and if you go to Academics and then click on Counseling, That'll get you to the Counseling Center page right here. And if you click on Financial Aid and Scholarships, this is pretty much a one-stop shop that will have everything that you need to know. So right at the very top, uh, we have the Financial Aid presentation. That is the PowerPoint that you're going to see shortly uh, pres uh, from our presenter from Lakeland University. And uh, the scholarship wall is still very much under construction. But as we in the Counseling Center receive information about scholarships, we will post it on that wall so that seniors can know what, what's available and what the uh, deadlines are to apply for those scholarships. Uh, seniors, we do recommend that you check this site on a very regular basis so that you are kept fully aware of all the different kinds of scholarships that are out there. Uh, moving further down the page, the first section is uh, FAFSA resources including a uh, summary of all the different kinds of federal aid that are uh, that's available. We've got some financial aid and scholarship links, uh, different search engines for scholarships and other resources. And then we also have some scholarship quick links, including down here the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation. And on their page, they have a scholarship link. And so with that, in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters from the uh, Public Education Foundation. But again, please do keep close tabs on our website, and if you have any questions about anything you see on there, please let us know. So now I'm going to turn it over to Terry Schersel and Roxanne Pauls, who are here representing the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation. I don't need the mic. Okay. Good evening, folks. Talking to the students, even though the parents here are the ones who worry and you are the ones who pay the bills, but it's the students here who have to step forward. Bottom line, bottom line, straight up. Something new this year that's FAP we've been hearing over the years. Why wait to January before you start the process and everything else? You have it now from your guidance counselor or your guidance all guidance counselors should have passed out, correct? Yes, all seniors got those folders in advisory on Tuesday. Okay, you have between now and March 1st which is the last, 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 last day to submit SPEP local scholarship applications. We understand that you have sports. We understand that you have religious church events. We understand that you have family events, that you do have a life outside of this building. But you also have a responsibility that if you are going to be applying for a scholarship, that you set up a schedule, a schedule that maybe you talk to your mom and dad about. That maybe I work on this one scholarship for this scholarship. Now, September, October, November, December. 
you're going, really? It's the first, second week of school? It's in your hands. Guaranteed. If you do not apply for a scholarship, you won't get it. That's a guarantee. If you do apply for it, you're in the mix. And we congratulate you. So what we've done this year, something different, something special, you all have a folder. Inside that folder, you all have handouts. The handouts are set up. Bring it in. Could you the handouts, copies, can be printed off of our website. I lost my folder. The dog peed on it. I don't know where it went. Print it out. Copies are there. Step up and take the responsibility. Cover page. Cover page. Like us on Facebook. We had one person from South High. He's the first person like us on Facebook. Why do we have to do that? Why? Because there's information on our site. We're a nonprofit organization, not related to the school district, but we support public education here in Sheboygan. So if you click down where it says South High School, oh, lo and behold, the list of every scholarship possible for students at South High School. Now, can I apply for every one of those scholarships? Probably not. Why? Because some scholarships are just set up for maybe if you are, if you are going into business or into the medical field or into education. You will hear, or we will hear, why are there more scholarships for North High School than South High School? Why? Because the donors who are spending their money may have gone to North High School. Example, when I shared it earlier, teacher who uh, I had here and I taught here for 33 years, Mr. Ken DeShamble passed away. He was a great English teacher. His family set up a scholarship for a South High student. It will be a cold day and you know where before anybody from North High School <laughs> or the charter schools receive a Ken DeShamble educational scholarship. Why? because the family wanted to recognize his years of service here at South High School. On the flip side, Elaine Holman was a great English teacher at North High School. Her two boys set up a scholarship to remember her and her years of service at North High School. It will be a cold day before anybody from South High ever gets the Elaine Holman North High School scholarship. And that's the skin of it. It's the donor. And the donors, yes, the donor, maybe he or she is in engineering and they wanted to go into uh, engineering. That's it. So take a look at the list. The list is there. The calendar. And for some of you parents are going, you've got to be kidding, you can't read that. Well, it was actually not done on purpose, but for you younger people, you can read this very well. <laughs> no. For us older people, blended bifocals. What should I be doing in the month of September, October, November, December? Flip it over, January, February. And then, and then, the deadline is March 1st. Which means, students, don't have your mom or dad walk up to our offices on Friday, March 1st. Could you please do it yourself? Could you do it maybe? the day before, the week before, versus calling them up on your cell phones in your seventh hour class or whatever hours they have here now, like 20. Call it mod 30. Mod 30, whatever. <laughs> and that, take responsibility. Do it yourself. Don't have your parents do it. And then after the scholarship night, it's going to be, if you think I'm on a roll now, wait until you hear this. Can you write a thank you note? Rox? Yeah. From the donors. One donor hasn't gotten a thank you note in two years. I'm telling you, students, I don't know. Don't tell me you're busy. Come on. You're making a hundred five hundred dollars, a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand dollars, and you're too busy to write a thank you note. And I'll say it to you. Shame on you. Your mom or dad should not be telling you 
Did you write a thank you note? Did you write a thank you note? You write a thank you note. Why do I say that? Because you never know what the donor is going to do. It's happened twice in my years. One time scholarship, person writes a nice thank you note at the semester break. The donor talks to us and says, you know what? Let's continue the scholarship. Don't know. It may happen or it may not. It's the donor. I also know that if you don't write a thank you note, the donor might say, you know what? I was thinking about extending the scholarship, but Johnny or Susie never wrote me a thank you note, so you know what? Let's just stay with the commitment of one year. That's happened. Person lost thirty thousand dollars. True story. Thank you, note, please. But once again, out of our hands, out of parents' hands, it's up to the student. And then by August fifteenth, could you please tell us if you're going to school or not? Things change. We understand that. Universities change. You might be thinking about going to UW Madison in your trunk, and I might go this one or that one or something else. Let us know, because we don't know what your plans are. It helps us with the office. Big time. Big time. Third handout. Do not. Regan, I'll remember this. Do not. Do not go to the high school counseling center and request a transcript on Friday, September 14th. You guys will call us up and say, see, we told you they're going to be coming in. Your first semester, senior year isn't done yet. Let's wait until January 25th, 26th, 27th-ish. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. And they'll tell you, then you request a transcript. Don't go to Mrs. Stuby and ask for one now. We could be in trouble with her. If I can take on what you're saying, you're exactly right, because uh, the current transcript is only going to be up through the end of junior year. And uh, while that may be impressive, the scholarship donors are definitely going to want to see how your senior year is going. And it isn't until first semester is done that we're going to have all the information for them to see on that. So yeah, late January is the earliest that you should be coming and knocking on our door for, for those trips. Okay. I said that publicly, correct? I you tell Cheryl that. So if someone comes in, they're not calling us. Okay. Now, to get to it in seriousness, I can come down to this page. How about Roxanne Terry, my son or daughter, or my, I, I can think about applying for a couple, two, three, four different scholarships. How do we do it? How do we keep it uh, organized? <coughs> How do we keep it organized? <coughs> what was that? I'll be darned. She said, put it in the folder. Absolutely. That's what it is. documents so you don't have to finish it in one night you can come back to it save it and things like that so it's word documents I complete one and I'm going to use Janice Condor Memorial Music Scholarship if you're not going to music you're not applying for this one by the way <laughs> just so your seniors can figure that one out okay. click on that please Now, every scholarship on the website and at SPEP has a bio sheet, which is the sheet to the left. Could you please read it, students? It gives you background on the person, on the family, and the reason behind the scholarship. As a former language arts teacher, that is a hint on how to slant your essay question. If they say Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones was big on volunteerism, well, I wonder if I should put down all the volunteer work that I do. Laugh well, silly on that one. Yes, put it down. Put it down. But it tells you all about it. It tells you sometimes what the scholarship is. And this is where we get to play the games. I'm not going to fill out a scholarship unless it's worth a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. I don't know about math, but just to earn my third grade, 750, 750, 750, 750. 
is more than a $2,000 scholarship. I don't know about you, but that's how I would look at it. So, students, you do what you want. Out of our hands, in your hands. It gives the criteria that the family has set up or the donor has <coughs> set up. It gives you the procedure. And then it gives you the essay question. <coughs> Can we write five pages, single space, five point type? No, one page, 12 point. Why? Because some of the donors can't, like some of us older people, including myself, we just can't read five point type. For your seniors, you can read that real easy, but you know, just take it easy. One page. Sometimes there's two questions. One page. One page. So I finished this one. When I finished the essay, <coughs> I finished the essay, I put it in the folder. Could I come back maybe when I have some time in October, November, December, January, February to clean it up? Oh, would I have maybe an adult look at it to proofread it? If you don't understand what a green line underneath where it is, or a red line underneath where it is, or ink dot one one time, hey, let's go for a ride around North Point Park. We, we want to watch our grammar. We want to watch our spelling. One thing I would recommend for you seniors, never have another student read your essay. No offense. No insult to you. No insult to you, but it puts you in a pretty of a jam. Especially, think about this. How about if I ask one of my senior friends to read my senior essay for a senior scholarship? I read it and go, man, that's pretty good. Maybe I should apply for that scholarship. Just tell you, just have someone read it, but not have a student who is also competing for the same scholarship. <coughs> Put it in the folder. Also, it's not in the folder, but it's online. If you go back a couple and then back up here, the um, scholarship application, local scholarship application. Roxanne and I met with the principals, with the guidance counselors, and with the superintendent and assistant superintendent to revise the local scholarship form. I have one in my hand, you have it up here. If you're applying for colleges right now, you're doing a lot of this stuff right now. The parents' name, address, all that other stuff. How many siblings you have, that's all you gotta go over, all this stuff, everything else. You can do that right now. You're not turning anything in now, but you can get it done. And when you finish it, where will you put it, students? In the folder, right? Could I maybe add to my activities and everything else because I'm going to be involved in a sport or activity this semester, this winter, or something else? Absolutely. But most of the work is done ahead of time. Done ahead of time. So you're not rushing when it comes February. So that's the application. <coughs> and the last handout, and then I will be quiet, and then you're on, if I covered it correctly. The three most asked questions. Where do I find out what SPEF scholarships are available? Students, answer the question without reading the answer in front of you. Where would you find out what, where and what SPEF scholarships are available? Where do you think? Would you A, go to the SPEF website? at www.sheboyganschools.org. Would you talk to Mr. Regan? Mr. Holland. <coughs> Mr. Holland. Okay. Go to the website. It's right there. It's right there. And then read it. Two, how do I complete a, a SPEF scholarship? Your third handout, it had the boxes, went down the procedures for you. If you have a question, Roxy, Roxanne, 
Could anybody call us at 208-7667? Jiminy Crickers, we will answer the phone. We will even respond to an email. Why is all that stuff? It's all there. And can I submit my scholarship prior to the deadline date? Only if you've completed everything. Don't just submit the Janus Congress scholarship and then the next scholarship and then the next scholarship and the next scholarship and the next scholarship because we will not have a checklist and say, um, Sally, Jimmy, you are missing your transcript. That's your responsibility to go over this page and to make sure that you have everything there. But just say, February 15th, just for the heck of it. You're done. Proofread, letters of recommendation. You'd be asking people to write letters in September, October, November, December, January, and February, versus, hey, Mr. Scherzel, the deadline is Friday. It's only Thursday. Can you write me a letter and I'll pick it up tomorrow morning? Look up. Give the person an opportunity to write a great letter of recommendation. But you do that now. Does it always have to be a teacher? Roxanne? No, it's not. Who could it be? Our neighbor, someone in church, if you go to church, if you have a part-time job, if you're involved with a school sport or another sport, could it be maybe an uncle or aunt, a grandma and grandpa? I, I don't know. Put on the list. It all depends what the scholarship is for. But give, and I'll say for teachers here, give the teachers the benefit of the doubt and not ask them a week before the deadline for a letter of recommendation. That's wrong. That's real wrong. You had it here on September 13th. You had it here on September 13th. Give me some time to write a kick letter of recommendation for you. Then on February 15th, I have my folder and everything is done. My transcript I got from the office, Guyon's off, Tonsley Center, and I have checked it off and I know everything's in this folder. I'm ready to go. Do you have to wait until March 1st to turn it into our office? Absolutely not. But wait until everything is done for the scholarship that you are applying for. And the last thing, and then I will shut up. The last thing, check our website. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter D. Because you never know what scholarships come in. Last year we had three scholarships come in between January 25th, 27th, and the deadline date. Why? Because of family situations, funerals, at the memorials, they wanted to do a quick scholarship. It's there. It's there. What did I miss? Nothing that I can think of. Oh, that was shut up. Go for it. Something that we've noticed at Lakeland University students have been writing essays for various scholarships. They're using text ladle. Mm -hmm. Using the letter U rather than Y-O-U. And even this is for people that were applying for our honors program, believe it or not. So I keep it, know your audience. Because our professors, they were not impressed. So make sure you're doing those types of things very carefully. Uh, okay, so that was a great prologue. So next we have uh, Sue Bialk from Lakeland University to give you the main portion of tonight's presentation on the financial aid process. Uh, before I forget though, uh, and thank you to uh, Terry and Roxanne for coming in from the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation. We know that... Uh, we know that you will benefit from a refresher on all information in a few months time. There is on our school calendar a presentation that is currently listed as being in early February for the local
a scholarship presentation. We have moved that up, I believe, to January 30th. Um, even though it's not reflected on the official school calendar right now, we're going to send out a messenger, uh, like you should have gotten a phone call regarding tonight. We'll do a similar thing for that January 30th event in enough time so that you all know. Okay. Oh, what? We have a An mistake. I don't know. On the three most asked questions when applying for a SPEF scholarship, www. Sheboygan. S H E B O Y G A N. Director of Financial Aid at Lakeland University, and the other hat I wear is the Director of Veteran Services. So if we do happen to have anybody in the room that may qualify for some veterans benefits, we can always talk about that later on. And just before I start, there's a few people that are standing. If you want to take an opportunity to sit down, this is going to be probably a good hour presentation, so I'm just going to fair warn you. Um, this is a little bit new and improved compared to what we've done in years past. Some of the slides I will skip through rather quickly and others we're going to spend a little bit more time on. Some of the topics that we're going to be discussing this evening will be what is financial aid, what is cost of attendance, expected family contribution, financial need, the different categories and types of financial aid that are available, and then the free application for federal student aid will actually be going through some of the different looks and feels of the FAFSA. For those of you that have done it in the past, it's going to have a brand new look. And one of the other new things that's coming up is a mobile app. So things are going to be, get much better. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is funding from various sources to help pay college expenses. And cost of attendance. When you're starting to do things like the FAFSA, they look at cost of attendance. It's tuition and fees, and that's a billable expense by whichever college or university you're attending. Room and board. For some of you, you might be living at home, but others of you might be living on campus somewhere. Then again, going into maybe a junior year or senior year, you might be living in an apartment off campus. Regardless of where you live, you're going to have some sort of living expenses. Books and supplies. With some universities, your books might be included, but with many, they are not, and you're going to have to be able to purchase those books on your own, so you need to be prepared for those types of expenses. Transportation. Somehow you need to get back and forth to that college or university. It might be a car. It might be a plane ticket. It might be a bus ticket. So there's an expense in getting back and forth. And then there's the miscellaneous expenses. Some of you may have cell phones that you have to pay for. You may have to purchase clothing, school supplies, computers, things like that. So all of that is built into the financial aid budget. So each university that you're working with is going to have what they expect their costs to be. So it's a measurement of then there's expected family contribution. So when you're doing the FAFSA, it's going to come up with this figure that the Department of Ed thinks you can pay. Now you might not necessarily agree with that figure, but it's done across the board so it's equal for every student across the nation. So whether you live in Wisconsin or Michigan or California or Florida, they use the same calculation throughout. Now that doesn't mean that it's less expensive to go to schools in different areas because we all know that different states have different prices to them. But it's going to be calculated the same way. In the expected family contribution, there's a parent component and there's a student component. So when we're looking at financial aid, we take the cost of attendance and we have to report that to the Department of Edu Education you subtract out that expected family contribution, and that becomes what's then called financial need. In the types of financial aid that is offered, there's need-based aid, and then there's non-need-based aid. 
So need-based aids, things like Pell Grant, because there may be financial need. Um, when you go to non-need, that's going to be more like scholarship or some of the unsubsidized types of loans. And we'll be getting into that in a little bit more. So the types of financial aid, there's, there's self-help and there's gift aid. When we look at gift aid, the first area is scholarships. That's the free money. You don't have to repay it back. You want to get as much scholarship as you can. You just had a great gentleman here telling you all about the different types of scholarships that's available in Sheboygan County. You need to apply for those types of scholarships. At the different schools that you're attending, make sure you're applying for any of their specialty scholarships that are available. And then the last area that you're going to go to is the different search engines that are out there and available to students to apply for different scholarships. There's one scholarship app, it's, it's a new app, it's called the Sally app. It was created by a gentleman that was on Shark Tank that funded his entire college career by going through all of those different search engines meticulously and finding funding for his costs. Now, he found that process to be a little bit cumbersome, so he created an app for it. He, does, he is an entrepreneur, he charges $2.99 a month for it, but it is another way for you to apply for scholarships, and it makes it a little bit easier for students moving forward. Grants, grants are more need-based, so Maybe some institutions may add some funding to your award letter because you have more need. Pell Grants, SEOG, those are all need-based grants, so it's based on your finances. On the other side is going to be your self-help. So that's going to be loans and work study. There are federal loans that are available to you, and some of, we'll discuss that a little bit further. And then work study, that's the other area. So to, if you're not getting enough scholarship and grant dollars, this is your only option, loans and working. So the different sources of financial aid is going to be federal aid, there's a federal government, state aid, in the state of Wisconsin, we do have Wisconsin grant that you apply for by going through the FAFSA process. Different colleges and universities have their own scholarship programs. Then the private sources, those are the places like through Sheboygan County, and make sure you're applying for those opportunities. And then make sure you're checking with your employers. Um, you want to see if your employers or parents, if they have any opportunities for your kids as students for scholarship dollars. And if so, make sure your student is applying for them. For the federal government sources, it's going to be that's the largest source of financial aid that is out there. And it's primarily awarded based on need. So what is your financial background? You must apply every year through the FAFSA, and you must make sure you meet all the federal requirements to be eligible for it. <coughs> so these are the various types of federal student aid that is out there. The largest or the first one we're going to talk about is Pell Grant. It's the largest federal grant program that is out there. It is need-based. It does not need to be repaid. And it can only be used for an undergraduate program. If a student is going on for their master's program, it is no longer available. Some students may apply under the Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan grant if a parent served in the military and was killed during that process. Um, the other one would be a TEACH grant, and that is specific to those students that may be looking to go into education. One thing with the TEACH grant, though, is you have to be careful with it. If you do not meet the requirements of teaching in a specific type of school setting for the number of years that is required, it does turn into a loan. Then there's federal work study. It's working on the campus that you go to. Now the way we work it at Lakeland, as students receive, as students get federal work study, they have to find a job on campus. It's not guaranteed. And as they work the hours, that's how they get paid. So when you're seeing your initial bill coming to you, you're not going to see work study dropping that invoice and dropping that cost because you have to work to earn the money. So students maybe have to do a time card just like I do. And they get paid twice a month just like I do. 
but they can use that funding that they're receiving during their working hours to pay on their tuition. Then there is the loan program. So for freshmen entering their first year of school, they can receive 5,500 in loan. For sophomore status, it goes up to 6,500. And then for junior and senior status, it goes up to 7,500. Part of that loan is going to be, sub, could be subsidized. There will also be unsubsidized loan. The difference between those is when interest starts to accrue. If it's subsidized loan, it does not accrue any interest during enrollment or the grace period. If it is unsubsidized, it will. They have the same interest rate, the same origination fees. You, you get a six month grace period before you go into repayment. So everything else is the same. It's just that interest subsidy during enrollment. Now the way that works, it goes back to that cost of attendance and that financial need. If you have financial need after all of your scholarship is awarded, then we can award subsidized loan. If you filled all your need with scholarship, we can only award unsubsidized loan. The other type of loan that is available is a parent plus <coughs> loan. That is a loan through the parent, so parents can borrow additional funding to help pay any remaining costs that the student would have. Now parents do need to be able to pass a credit check in order to secure that loan. If for some reason the parent does not pass the credit check, then we can treat the student as an independent student for loan purposes only, and we can award an additional $4,000 of unsubsidized loan for freshman or sophomore status, or $5,000 as junior or senior status. And then I'm going to go into the state. Like I said, the state of Wisconsin does have a state grant program. It is based on the cost of attendance at the school. So if you are comparing award letters, what you may see from a private school compared to what you may see from a state school is going to look very different. But it is the same process of going through the FAFSA, and the FAFSA looks at that EFC to see if you are eligible for state grant or not. Since you are from the state of Wisconsin, it is extremely important when you are completing that FAFSA and you're putting in the section what schools you are thinking about attending and you want them to receive your information, that you list some Wisconsin schools in there because that information is gonna go through the state of Wisconsin to determine your eligibility. So make sure since you are from Wisconsin that you are listing at least one Wisconsin school. For colleges and universities, all of us have different ways of dispersing specialty scholarships that we have. We have internal scholarship based on GPA and ACT scores that we use. We also have some specialty scholarships. Now we have some very early deadlines because the FAFSA opens in October. We want to start awarding probably in like mid-December, if not maybe a little earlier, so we have to have some of the decisions already made on our internal scholarships. So many of ours at Lakeland are due mid-November already. So we're not as kind as some of these other organizations. So make sure you're checking out the websites of the, the schools that you're looking at to see if they have any deadlines for any of the scholarship opportunities. Private sources. Again, look at the areas um, where you can get different funding through the community. Make sure you're watching those deadlines. You've just had that conversation. And begin looking at these things very early on. Employers, again, see if your employers have any opportunities for your students. And then let's go on to some information on the FAFSA. The FAFSA is a way of collecting different demographic information about you and your family. And it's information that we as financial aid administrators use in order to complete your award letter. It is available both in Spanish and in English. Several years ago, the FAFSA used to open on January 1, and it was based off of that same tax return that you were getting ready to prepare in January. That changed a couple of years ago. It is now open on October 1st, 
and for the 1920 FAFSA, you will be using 2017 tax return information. There are some colleges and universities out there that may have a FAFSA deadline. Some schools do not, so make sure, again, you're checking those schools' websites to see if they do have any deadlines. There's a couple of different ways that you can complete the FAFSA. You can do the FAFSA on the web, which is one of the ways we're going to be showing you in a little while. And new is the My Student Aid mobile app. So it is now going to be cell phone friendly. As of right now, if you download that app, it is a beta version. And it's going to have information only right now for the 1718 FAFSA. As of October 1st, they will be changing it over and you will only be able to use it for the 1920 FAFSA. So if you want to get an early look to see what it looks like, go ahead and download it, but it will be updating just a little bit as of October. There is a way that you could do a paper FAFSA, but I may say don't do that. It is the last resort for anybody. FAFSA on the phone, I don't want to recommend that one either. And the last one is for us financial aid professionals that we can get in to make any corrections as we need to. So doing it on the web or doing it on your cell phone through the app. The benefits of using FAFSA on the web is it has built-in edits. So as you're answering questions, if you answer it a certain way, it may skip a few and then go on and skip a few and go on. So it makes it a little bit easier than if you're trying to do something on paper and you think you got an answer every single page and there's 14 pages. So it's a lot easier if you do that and use the skip logic. It also is going to allow you to use what's <laughs> called the IRS data retrieval tool where you can import that tax return right into the FAFSA. Benefits of My Student Aid, the new mobile app. It's going to be just timely as well and there's also going to be more detailed help section, so if you're not sure on how to complete a certain way, you can easily get the help. It has the ability so you can check to see where you're at in the process, and it's just much more simplified. So when you go to FAFSA on the web, this is the new look and feel of it. So it's a little bit different than what you've seen before. So if you are a new person that you've never done one before, you're going to new to FAFSA.gov. And then if you're a returning user, you're going to go to the other side. Now that's one other thing I want to point out. Anything that you're, you are applying for through the government is .gov. It is not FAFSA.com, but .gov. Here's another new feature. When you're going in, are you the parent or are you the student? It's finally going to be a little bit more specific because we have a lot of parents out there that they want to go out there and they want to do that FAFSA. Guess whose FAFSA it is? It's the student's FAFSA. And there's parts that they need to complete and then there is certainly a part that the parent <coughs> needs to complete. So this is going to identify a little bit easier for who's the student and who's the parent. If I could have a dollar for every parent that put in their income in the student section, I'd be a rich person. Sometimes I thought, what am I doing wrong? These students are making that kind of money, really? Hmm. And here is a look and feel of the new mobile app, what it will look like. Pretty nice. Very simple to use. So you're, again, going in as the student or as the parent. Um, during the time that you're going in there, you are going to be prompted to have a save key. You will need to be entering either one of these sites by using what's called an FSA username and password. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And here it can show just where you're at with everything. So here it shows you know, student information, school selection, dependency status, parent information. So it's going through all the different parts that you're going to need to complete. There's an area when you see this where you
where you think you can sign, and yes, you can put your signature in there, but it's not the official signature. You do need to sign in with your FSA username and password in order to get through everything. So using the IRS data retrieval tool. When we go through the FAFSA a little bit later, you're going to need to be able to see this. And it's an important thing that I would, I would hope that you would use if at all possible. The only time that the IRS data retrieval tool does not work is if you filed an amended return, if a marital status changed from what you filed as. So let's say you filed married, and now later on, now you're separated. Because you filed married and you're now listing yourself as separated, it is going to have a kick out that's not going to let you to do that. Those are the times when you do need to work with us as financial aid professionals that we can help you through that process. The good thing about having the information automatically transferred is it's accurate. There's a process called going through verification that the Department of Education randomly selects files that need to be verified. And if you're one of them, if you use the IRS data retrieval tool, we're good. If you did not, we're going to have to have you request your IRS tax transcripts, and that can take a little bit more time. So it's a really great idea to use this, if at all possible. This again shows a little bit why you may or may not be able to use the IRS data retrieval tool. If a parent doesn't have a social security number, it will not work if marital status changed. If you're filing, if you're married and you're filing separately, that will also cause a, cause a kick out because it's a very rare thing that parents should be filing separately if they're married. So this is going to show you a screen of what it looks like when you need to set an FSA username and password. Each student needs to create an FSA username and password, and at least one parent needs to create an FSA username and password. Parents, if you have created one already for a older student, that will stay with you. When you're going through this process, you're going to enter your username, your password, and then you're going to have to enter your birth date, your social security number. You're going to set up some security questions. You're going to need to put in an email address, a cell phone number if you have one. And part of that is because you may forget that username or you may forget that password. And if you need to retrieve the information, that's what you're going to use to get that information to you. So for students, please don't use your high school email address when you're setting that up. Make sure you're using a Gmail or a Yahoo type of address because you're not going to have access to that high school email anymore when you're at school someday and all of a sudden you need to get into this information. <coughs> students and parents, each create your own. Parents don't do it for your students and students don't do it for your parents. I know sometimes students think their parent is a little bit electronically challenged and they're just not going to get it and they do it for them and then later on everything starts getting complicated and in between and then we're trying to work with the Department of Ed to pull everything back apart. So please do these on your own. There is a FAFSA worksheet that you can print out ahead of time if you want to just so you have all the information that you may need in the process of completing it. And then this is some of the general information that you're going to need to enter. Student social security number, citizenship status, marital status, drug convic conviction status. For guys in the room, when you turn 18, you have to register with selective service. If you are 18 already when you're doing the FAFSA, you have to have that completed. If you are 17, you can request that the FAFSA do that on your 18th birthday. So make sure you're doing that. It will ask for the highest education level of a parent. And then there's going to go through different things for determining dependency. The vast majority of students your age are going to be dependent on your parents' information. It is very rare that you are considered independent. It does not matter just because you live in an apartment on your own or your parents aren't, filing, aren't, aren't attaching you to their tax return. That does not make you independent. So 
we will be asking information for parents, what types of taxes they've done, their income, assets, um, if they are a dislocated worker, um, untaxed income, there's going to be different information that you're going to need to gather. Um, for those that are independent students, there may be a spouse information that is asked. And then it's going to also ask you for what schools you want the information to go to. And at each school, where do you plan to live? Then are the signatures that are required that you do submit that FAFSA with that FSA username and password. Frequent FAFSA errors would be social security numbers. You need to make sure you're entering that correctly. And the other thing I'm going to tell you is you need to use the legal name on your social security card. So if your name legally is Joseph and you've gone by Joey all your life, you need to fill out the FAFSA with Joseph. Um, income earned by parents and step-parents. I had a chart back there that goes through who is your parent, and I'll be going through that in a moment, of just knowing what parent information goes into the FAFSA, untaxed income, taxes paid. It's not what you necessarily all paid in because you might be getting a refund check. You have to know what was the actual amount of taxes paid. Household size, how many are in your household, how many are in college, and then what is the different net worth. Once the FAFSA is completed, it goes through the central processing system and it goes to you and to us as the colleges. You're gonna get what's called a student aid report telling you what they believe you can pay. And if you did everything with email, you will get an email response. If you did something with paper, you would get a paper response. If you do need to make any corrections, it'll be something that you can go back and do, but you can never change any of the amount for any asset information or balances. The only type of corrections you should be making is if somebody in the financial aid office tells you to do so. Special circumstances. There's a lot of times when, okay, you're doing your FAFSA in October and you're doing it on 2017 tax information. And maybe even by the time you're going off to school, something happens. Maybe parents get laid off from a job. Um, maybe there's a death in the family. Something major happened. When those things occur, contact your financial aid office so they can take a second look. Now they may have to request some specific documentation from you, but they're always willing to take a look to see if that could change anything. And here are some of the different reasons why. Parent or spouse death, if parents separate or go through a divorce, if there's a loss of employment, if there's unusual Medicare or medical expenses that aren't covered by insurance, these are all reasons why you want to contact a financial aid office. And let's go through the FAFSA now. So back to our entry screen, this is what it looks like when you're signing in. You're signing in as the student or you're signing in as the parent. You're going to enter in your FSA username and password. And then you're going to start in entering things like social security number information and date of birth. And notice over on the side where the question marks are, if you click on any of those question marks, it's going to be able to give you a help section. So dependent students with parental data. So you're gonna to have to accept the terms. And keep in mind that right now the screen is showing 18, 19 on this side, and 17, 18. So this is what we're looking at right now. We can't see the 19, 20 until everything opens up. You're going to create a save key so that as you're entering information, if you have to leave it and go back, it's going to be kept. So anytime you have questions, you can open up the next Open up the section by clicking on the arrow and it will give you a little bit of information of what you need to put in. And then we're going to start with name. So you're going to enter in your last name, first name, middle initials, 
Social Security number and date of birth. Address information, email address. And of course, when you're, what are you going to say? How many years did you live in the state? Did you make? Did you live in the state for five years? <coughs> many times that is used for different state documents. Then you're going to answer if you're male or female. Phone number, driver's license. Then it's going to ask you your marital status. For most of you in the room, I would say you're single. So you're going to enter that. And here's where you're going to answer for the guys in the room if you've registered with Selective Service. Here's another area that seems to be a lot of mistakes. When you are completing your FAFSA, your high school seniors, you're going to put in the last, what was your high school completion status, a high school diploma. You are going for your first bachelor degree or your associate's degree. You are not being a graduate professional. That makes a big difference on what type of aid is awarded if you don't put in the right type of information in the section. Are you interested in work study? Yes or no. Were you part of a foster care program? Yes or no. And then what is the highest grade level of parent one and parent two? And then it's going to ask you if you've ever received federal aid before and if you've been convicted of any drug-related charges. Here you're going to see as we're going through the section how the top line starts moving through. Here it's going to ask you now for the name of the high school you attended and where your high school is located. And then it's going to ask you for the school's information of who you want the FAFSA sent to. So it's going to ask if you know our federal school code. If not, you can always look them up. And as you're putting them in there, it'll list every one that you have. Now you can see here in this top one, it says University of Houston. There, that student is planning to live on campus. If they're going to Loyola University in New Orleans, they're going to say, I'm going to live off campus. So you can change your residency dependent on each school that you're listing. Then it's going to ask them questions on, were you born before January 1st, 1996, when you get in there? Are you married? Are you doing any sort of a post-undergraduate degree program? Do you have any children that, are, that you are supporting or any dependents? Most of you, I would think. And then here are some additional questions. And these are all, de all out there because of dependency status. So for those of you that may be going into the armed forces, if you become a veteran, that automatically makes you independent. So all of these are answered based on those dependency questions. Most of you will be checking none of the box. Now the other thing I want to point out on the top here do you notice the band here where it says student information? You see it on the top there? It's student information. So this is telling you whose information should be in there right now. And then as it determines that yes, you are dependent on your parent, am I going to be able to provide parent information or not? I really want you to provide that information, but if there's some reason why you can't, we will work with you, but you're only going to qualify for unsubsidized loans. Again, see how it keeps moving over? Now, parent status. What parent do you put in there? If you were lucky to get here early enough, I had some ch of this chart laying out in the back. So, if mom and dad are married, your biological parents are married, and you live there, your mom and dad's biological parents are on here. Let's say mom and dad are divorced, and you live with mom. Whose information goes on the FAFSA? Mom's. If mom is remarried, whose information goes on the FAFSA? Mom's and stepdad's. Okay, so 
It's not necessarily based on who your biological parent is. It's parent one, parent two. Who do you live with? Now, for some of you that are in divorce situations, well, let's say it's 50-50. 50% by mom, 50% by dad. Then who is supplying the majority of the funding? Is there one that has a little bit more financial responsibility? That is the parent that should go on the FAFSA. I've had another parent say, well, it's 50-50-50-50-50-50. Okay, well, what's the legal address for the student? Sometimes you got to get down to some things like that. So this is a nice chart to help you determine whose information goes on that FAFSA. And you'll start entering then that parent's information for parent one and, if applicable, parent two. But for the parent, it's the social security number, last name, first initial, and birth date because it does have to match up, again, with social security, Homeland Security, Department of Justice, all of that has to be able to match up. <laughs> Parents' email address will also be used. And what is, were they living in that state for five years? Now again, did you notice that it has a change now to the student information going across the top? It says parent information. Okay. So the next biggest thing is how many in the household how many in college because that's going to help determine with that expected family contribution if you have two in college that amount gets divided in two so if you have let's say mom dad and there's three in the family with let's say your oldest is in this room right now senior you've got two more at home five in the family one in college if you have an older one in college and maybe they're not necessarily living at home because they stay wherever their college is during the summer, you still count them as part of the family and part of the number in college. It's only when that student or that person living at home is maybe around, let's say they're 26 and they're living at home, they're working, but they're still living with you, no, you can't count them anymore. For a number in college, if a parent is attending, you cannot include that parent in the number in college. So then it starts asking about the income information for the parent. So did you complete your 2017 tax return, yes or no? And what type of return did you file? I always think it's important to have that tax return out in front of you, even though you're going to try to use that IRS data retrieval tool. Because there's certain information on there that's still going to be beneficial. And it's especially when you want to link to that IRS data retrieval tool, which you're using that bottom button for. So in order to get there, the parent does need to sign in with their FSA username and password. And then it's going to take you to the IRS site. <coughs> so it's going to go through some things of requirements that you have to sign off on. And then you're going to enter your name and address exactly how it appears on that tax return, down to the punctuation. If you put 123 Main Street and you typed it out street on your tax return, you got to type it out here. If you abbreviated ST period, you abbreviated ST period here. So once you put that all in there, you're going to try to submit it all, and you're going to get here, it's going to say, Here's your information that can be transferred. If you want to transfer it, you're going to click on that top box and transfer. When it transfers over, you're not going to be able to see what actually transferred. The numbers are not going to be there. And that's specific because if some reason, somehow, somebody gets into your FAFSA, you don't want them to have that information. So it, it is masked specifically for that reason. So you're transferring that information over, and it's going to show you any time information was transferred over. And then it's going to ask some additional questions along if other different things were filed. Now one thing you really want to make sure you're looking at is that bottom line where it says, did any of, if you, if you stopped a job, and you, let's say you had a 401k, and you rolled it over into an IRA, 
If you don't check that you did that, it's going to look at income for you. So make sure if you've done any rollovers that you put it in this section here. And then we're going to get into some other things about assets. Did you receive any child support? Did you get any, um, did you put any tax deferred pensions in? And then it's going to ask about other untaxed reporting funding. And then it's going to go into what kind of assets do you have? If you have ass assets over 7,200, you can say yes or no. You're going to have to put in what is your balance between your checking, savings, and any basic funding that you have as of that day that you're submitting the, the FAFSA. If you have any investments that is real estate, so it doesn't count the home that you live in. So let's say you have a home, but now let's say you have that cabin up north. And if that cabin has a mortgage on it, you can take what the value is less the mortgage and that, that amount is an asset. So you do have to look at that. The only asset information that you do not need to claim is any retirement information. So 401ks or IRAs, Roth IRAs are okay, you don't have to claim them. Or um, any, <laughs> um, any of your life insurance policies. So retirement savings, life insurance policies, you do not need to claim as part of your assets. And then it's going to go back to student information. So if students, if you completed a 2017 tax return, you're going to have to do this part as well. If you did not, you're just going to put will not file. But if you did, it's going to go through that same process of going through the IRS data retrieval tool to put all that information in there. So I'm just going to skip through some of this. And then the student, you're going to put in your asset information. And again, see how it's saving it all the way through as you're getting through. So after you get all that information, the last thing is going to be is to sign and submit. So you're going to get into that next section. And you're going to need to provide parent signature and student signature. And you're going to have to go through some agreeing to different things. And then you're finally getting it all signed. And once you have both signatures completed, you submit your FAFSA now. And you're electronically signing with your ID. And you're done. It shouldn't take too long to complete the process, but it's very important that you do so. When you get that done, you're done. If you find that you're, there's some sort of an error, contact the financial aid office and they'll tell you what you need to do to fix it. You cannot go back and fix any assets. You might need to do some sort of a correction on a marital status. If you've entered something else incorrectly, we're going to let you know and we're going to say we need to go back and fix this. That is the vast majority of my presentation. Um, things that I would ask you to do is, you know, this is opening October 1st. Get started on, on it right away. The sooner you get the information in, the sooner the financial aid offices can get an award letter out to you. For students, you're going to get award letters from your school. And then when you get that award letter, you might need to electronically sign it with your school, or you might have to send back a paper copy of it to your school. If you are accepting any loans, you're going to need to complete entrance counseling and a master promissory note. Entrance counseling goes through the rights and responsibilities of taking out that loan. It's going to explain to you what is interest, when does it accrue, when do you need to make your first payment, what happens if you can't make that payment, what do you need to do. So parents, it's okay for you to sit with your student while they're doing that, but don't do it for them. 
They need to understand what that loan is all about. The other thing is that master promissory note. It's the promise to pay. That's the legal and binding document. When the student does that, they will need to have two references. The reference people do not have any ties to that loan. It's mainly used because students usually use their parents' permanent address, but they might be moving around after they graduate and they get lost. So they need a way to be able to find the student if they do get lost in order to get them into a good repayment habit. If you have additional money that you need to pay to the school that financial aid doesn't cover everything. Again, we talked a little bit about that parent plus loan that parents can borrow up to the cost of education. If that's not an option, because that's in the parent name and some parents say, mm, no, I'm not gonna do it. Then you might need to look at an alternative loan. There's a lot of different banks and lenders that do have student loans available. Most of those though will require a cosigner because of your young age and lack of credit. As a parent, if I'm needing to co-sign, I'm gonna look for a loan that has a co-sign release option. Many of the banks have that where maybe you need to make 24 monthly on time payments or 36 monthly on time payments, and then that co-signer can be released. So as you're looking at those options, do your homework. Make sure you're going into something that you can afford. Try to keep loans to a minimum. You have to pay them back. And there's nothing worse than when you leave with tons of debt. Remember, all those opportunities you have for scholarships, you have to do the work to get them. So it's really important that you do that process so you can keep those loans to a minimum. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Uh, actually, I think what we'll do is, if it's okay, we'll take a really quick one minute pause. If anyone has to leave right now, uh, you can do that so that you don't have to feel self-conscious uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so you can go ahead and leave now if you want. Otherwise, if you want to stay for questions, please do so. Uh, we'll have Q&A for about 15 minutes. 